Uh, I want to talk about mystical anarchism. Um, I've been thinking about this question for the last year, and I started to write this talk about three weeks ago, and um, it got a little bit out of control. I've got 42 pages, and I only reread them yesterday because I couldn't. I hadn't finished it until Monday, and I just I can't really reread until I've. I know I've finished, so I apologise to Ian in advance for making him read it, making his job harder. Um, and also, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do this, but let's just... So I've got a summary, which I'm going to try and keep to. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by drawing a, a, a triangle and saying, you know, how do we understand the political reality through which we're, we're moving at, at present. I think the political reality we're moving through is dominated by the factor of religious war. Um, we seem to have passed from a, a secular age, which we were told was post-metaphysical, to a new situation where political action seems to flow directly from religious belief, metaphysical conflict. So there's a fatal entanglement of politics and religion. Those are the two, it's the base of the triangle I want to construct. So politics and, how do we understand the present? Politics and religion and the fatal intrications of politics and religion. The third vertex of the triangle is, is violence. So it does the three concepts that can help us to get a grip on the present. It's politics, religion and violence. And in particular, the phenomenon of sacred political violence, which is all too obvious, it barely needs to be explained. The question of community has to be framed, I think, in terms of this triangulation of politics, religion, and violence. Um, I want to look at, that's my overall framework, I want to look at one way of thinking about that triangle, one phenomenon, and that's what I want to call mystical anarchism, of which more presently, it's a very strange thing. But one place to begin would be to say that the, um, would be to begin from, it, it's an obvious place to begin, but it, it's one that people refer to, Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt, in his lectures on, uh, on the concept of sovereignty, says, all significant concepts in the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. So Schmidt has this idea that all the concepts in modern politics, broadly, are secularized theological concepts. And we could give abundant evidence of that. Just one stop along the, uh, the route would be to look at, say, for example, the idea of the general will. Right, the general will in the 17th century referred to the will of God. In the 18th century, it refers to the will of the people. There's a transposition of the divine to the civic that takes place. Now, for to begin from that idea, um, Schmidt makes a very interesting remark in, in a couple of places. Now, maybe I'll begin with that. Uh, it's the following. It's to say that every conception of the political has to take a position on human nature. <clears throat> a position on human nature. The object of Schmidt's uh, attack of his animus is liberalism. What Schmidt loathes is liberal constitutionalism of the kind, say, defended by Obama. Obama is a classical liberal constitutionalist. Norms have to be derived, decisions have to be derived from norms, from legality. That's Obamaism. Schmidt defends an idea of the decision which overrides the norm, and that's what he calls the political. Okay. The two conceptions of politics which oppose liberalism uh, both derive from conceptions of human nature. One is authoritarianism, the other is anarchism. If you believe that human nature is fundamentally wicked, you'll be an authoritarian in politics. That's Schmidt's intuition. If you believe that human nature is essentially good, you'll be an anarchist. 
And Schmidt sees both positions as respectable positions, but obviously he favours authoritarianism. So an authoritarian belief in an authoritarian conception of community, if you like, an authoritarian conception of politics, derives from a conception of the essential wickedness of human nature. This is why, for Schmidt, the concept of original sin is the key concept for thinking about politics. The concept of original sin. And this is going to be essential in what I'm going to try and develop. For, for heroes of, of Schmidt, like Donoso Cortez and Joseph de Mestre, reactionary counter-revolutionaries of the early 19th century, human beings are naturally depraved, and essentially there is something defective in human nature. If there's something defective in human nature, we require the corrective of the church and the corrective of the state in order to maintain order. Right? So the legitimacy of the state and the legitimacy of the church flow from a belief in original sin. Human beings require the hard rule of authority because they are defective. If we could achieve a sinless union with others, then the state and church would disappear. Now, anarchists, on the other hand, according to Schmidt, he traces this view to, to Rousseau, but it's, it's, uh, it's all over the place. Anarchists believe that human wickedness is a, is a social and historical outcome. A social and historical outcome that overlays a nature which is essentially good. And if that nature is allowed free expression without the hindrance of the state, then human beings will be able to cooperate mutually and cooperatively. Right? So the two conceptions of politics that contrast with liberalism, authoritarianism, and anarchism flow from conceptions of human nature. Let me just stay with um, um, the idea of original sin. Because you might think original sin is some outdated relic from some you know, uh, religious past. The idea of there being something essentially defective in human nature is something which has been uh, repeatedly, uh, if you like, modernised. Um, for example, I want to present sort of three ways in which we, can, we, we, we rethink the idea of original sin. Um, Freud, right? Freud adopts a version of Schopenhauer's thesis that there is a, an essential disjunction between eros and civilization which as it were the natural life of the drives and human civilization. And that disjunction, Freud says in his, his more pessimistic moment, doesn't show any signs of being able to be reconciled. There's just a disjunction between, as it were, original sin in the guise of the drives and the work of civilization. Heidegger's, uh, Heidegger's early work, arguably, I would argue, is a rethinking of Luther's conception of original sin. The ideas you get in Heidegger of thrownness, of facticity, and inauthenticity are ways of thinking an essential lack, an essential defectiveness in human nature. Obviously, Lacan blends the two. Um, but there's a, a third version of the idea of original sin, to show that original sin is still very much with us. This would be a naturalized Darwinian idea of original sin. And the the philosopher who represents this view most powerfully, in my view, is John Gray, political philosopher at the LSE, or he was, he gave the job up. Not the guy that wrote the book on Venus and Mars, that's another. <laughs> another John Gray, I think, anyway. Uh, maybe he's moonlighting. But Gray, um, to put it brutally, Gray's thesis is that human beings are killer apes. Right? They're killer apes. Uh, the human being is homo rapiens, rapacious hominids. Huh? But it's not just that we're killer apes, we're killer apes with metaphysical longing. Huh? So we are killer apes who learn nothing from 
history, yet we long for some meaning to existence. And that's our tragedy for Grey. These two things uh, pull apart in different ways. So Grey um, defends a, a Darwinian naturalised idea of original sin. Right? That's another way of thinking this. And this is an incredibly um, persuasive idea. Because it, because it gives us reason to explain our misery and our sense of disappointment and dejection at the sphere of human action. Human beings fuck up because they're killer apes. Right? And they don't just fuck up, they fuck up and still long for meaning, for a narrative arc to their existence, as Obama would say. They still long for something else because they have a metaphysical longing as well. And once we give up the liberal humanistic ideas of progress, uh, and the perfectibility of humankind, and we reconcile ourselves to the fact that the human species is... Um, uh, human existence goes in cycles of sort of destructiveness, and eventually, this is where Gray's brilliant, he links this to the Gaia hypothesis, which suggests that, you know, the most, the most ludicrous extension of liberal humanism is the idea that we can save the planet, right? We can't save the planet. We're the problem. We're killer apes. Uh, but that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. The planet will save itself when human numbers have been sufficiently dramatically reduced, back down to about half a billion, uh, Gray suggests. So this is a sort of a reassuringly bleak, Darwinian naturalisation of the idea of original sin. There's an essential defectiveness to what it means to be human. And that's in continuity with this uh, older tradition that you find in people like Schmidt, that goes back to Catholic uh, political theology and the rest. Okay. Um, Gray suggests that we should reject the utopian impulse in political thinking. The utopian impulse for, a, say, a utopian community has always led to different forms of disaster, <clears throat> different forms of... Uh, Disaster, the idea that one should uh, impose virtue by means of terror, right? And the example is always Jacobinism, 1792 in, in, in France. Against that, Gray suggests that because we're killer apes with metaphysical longing, we should embrace what he calls political realism. Political realism is really a form of old-fashioned Burkean Tory thinking that, you know, if we get the sort of neoconservative thinking, I mean, conservatism traditionally as a political philosophy had a deeply pessimistic conception of human nature. So Gray wants to go back to that. Okay, the utopian impulse in thinking is a source of uh, human misery for people like Schmidt and Gray. So the question I want to address is whether that's the case. And what I want to look at now, and I can't do this in the detail I'd like to to do it in, is to look at the version of politics that they explicitly reject, namely anarchism. Now I've defended anarchism in, in a certain version in some recent work I've, I've done, but that's all very, very well. I want to defend the weirdest, most extreme form of anarchism imaginable, what I want to call mystical anarchism. And the issue here is going to take us back to um, the 11th century, briefly. And hopefully the fruits of this will, will emerge as we, as we move through it. And I want to focus on um, a specific heresy uh, that emerged in the 11th and 12th centuries and lasted through to the 16th century. And this is described with extraordinary brilliance by the um, historian Norman Cohn in his book, The Pursuit of the Millennium which is the, the, the book that Gray uh, leans on. Now, what Cohn is trying to diagnose and what um, uh, Gray is worried about is revolutionary millenarianism. What is revolutionary millenarianism? <clears throat> it's the idea that you, can, you find expressed in certain of the, the Jewish prophets, and then the early Christian church, and then it re-emerges re with extraordinary violence in the Middle Ages. The idea that uh, we're living in the last times, that the end is at hand. And 
what will happen is that uh, a, a, a Christ figure will appear, a messianic figure will appear, and uh, that Christ figure will rally to him a band of true saints, um, and they will identify an antichrist figure as an enemy, destroy the antichrist, and then Christ will rule with the company of the saints for a thousand years, hence the millennium, after which time there'll be the last judgment. Okay? That's, the, that's the structure of millennial thinking. Um, and it's, it's fascinating stuff. Revolutionary millenarianism desires a boundless social transformation that attempts to recover an egalitarian state of nature, uh, a kind of golden age of primitive communism. So what's behind forms of millenarian politics is the idea that we can throw off uh, the shackles of church and state. So the Antichrist always shifts in this thinking. The Antichrist can be, say, the, the Muslims in the case of the Crusades, uh, the Jews, pogroms against the Jews appear in this, 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 this period. But usually it's the Catholic Church. Usually it's the Pope or the King. That you can throw off the shackles of church and state and recover the Garden of Eden, recover paradise. Um, and in paradise, there would be no private property. There would be a commonality of ownership. There's a famous proverb from the English Peasants' Revolt from the late 14th century, which is possibly recited by the famous hedge priest John Ball, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then a gentleman? Okay? There was no hierarchy, inequality, and property in the Garden of Eden. You see where this is going. The so, inequality, private property, individualism, if you like, have their source in the fall, have their source in uh, the fact of original sin. The, the mystical anarchist heresy is the idea that we can recover a state of primary perfection, recover an Edenic, communistic state. We can build the new Jerusalem. Um, now, what's fascinating about uh, this form of millenarian revolutionary thinking is that it appears amongst the poor in re newly urbanized centers in Northern Europe. It appears in Italy as well, but the cone focuses on Northern Europe, Flanders, down the Rhine Valley. These, in, in, if you like, the, the Industrial Revolution begins um, back then with the advent of the textile industry. And what you have are uh, urbanized rural, <coughs> rural populations that go to the city and experience a sort of a dislocation in a new mode of production. And it, it appears that millenarian thinking arises in this context. Right? Um, amongst not just the poor, but amongst the socially dislocated poor. It's exactly the same argument that Marx will make however many centuries later about the emergence of the proletariat. Like the, pro, pro, what the, the category that describes the emergence of the proletariat is dislocation. It's not just that the poor have always been poor, what we have with the emergence of the proletariat is a newly dislocated poor. And these are the people who are ripe for forms of millenarian heresy. Um, you can extend this, you can actually, if you wanted to, and it's, it's a fascinating topic, look at the connection between um, forms of social dislocation, poverty, and radical religious belief. Another field study here would be thinking about the emergence of, uh, of radical forms of utopianism and communism in the 19th century, say in New York State in the most beautiful version would be the, the Shakers. Um, anyway, so where's this? Oh, oh, I should mention the flagellants here. This is also good. Um, Cone writes, the greatest wave of millenarian excitement, one that swept through the whole of society, was precipitated by the most universal natural disaster of the Middle Ages, the Black Death. Right? It's a correlation between disease, social upheaval, and new forms of utopian communistic thinking. Um, the flagellant movement, for example, 
appeared in Perugia in 1260 as an apparent consequence of the famine of 1250 and the plague of 1259. It swept from Italy into the Rhine Valley. Flagellation was like the, 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 the latest thing amongst the poor. It swept like wildfire across Europe. Uh, great crowds of itinerant flagellants went from town to town like a scourging insurgency becoming godlike through acts of collective imitatio Christi. Now, such extreme self-punishment was deemed heretical because it threatened the church's authority over the economy of punishment, penitence, and consolation. The poor were not meant to take the whip into their own hands. Right? That was the issue. Who, who, who holds the whip? So that's one example. But the centerpiece of Cohn's analysis, and what I want to turn to now, and it's going to get pretty weird, is uh, the heresy of the free spirit. The heresy of the free spirit which we know relatively little about, but it's the central heresy of the Middle Ages. Everything turns here on the interpretation of St. Paul's words. Paul writes in Corinthians 2, Now the Lord is in the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. Where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. Now there are two possibilities of interpretation here. Um, Either the Lord's Spirit is outside the self, or it's inside the self. If the Lord's Spirit is outside the self, because the soul languishes in sin, then freedom can only come through submitting oneself to the divine will, and awaiting the saving activity of grace. That's orthodox Christian teaching. Standard Christian teaching. Which explains the necessity for the authority of the church. The church is, if you like, the portal to the divine that we require, given our sinful state. But if, and this is the key to the heresy, if the Lord's Spirit is within the self, then the soul is free and has no need of the mediation of the church. Indeed, and we'll come back to this, if the, the Lord's Spirit is within the self, then essentially there's no difference between the soul and God. You become God at that point. The heretical Adamites who moved to Bohemia after being expelled from Picardy in the early 15th century are reported as beginning the Lord's Prayer with the words, Our Father who art within us. Right? Our Father who art within us. If a community participates in the Spirit of God, then it is free and has no need of the agency of the church or the state or law or the police. These are institutions which an unfree community has imposed upon it. So you can see the anarchistic consequences of this, this heresy, I hope. Um, now, there's, there was an abundant uh, literature of the free spirit in the Middle Ages, which was almost completely destroyed by the Inquisition. Uh, there are some apocryphal texts. Uh, but the one text, which it was only discovered in 1946 as, as uh, belonging to this, the, this, this woman, is a text by Marguerite Porret, and it's called The Mirror of Simple and Annihilated Souls and Who Remain Only in Wanting and Desire of Love. It's a great title. Right? <laughs> the Mirror of Simple and Annihilated Souls and Who Remain Only in Wanting and the Desire of Love. So. This woman, Marguerite Porret, who I'd urge you to, to, to read if you, if you have the, uh, the inclination, writes this extraordinary text. She writes other texts, a text on the refinement of love, which was, which was burnt with her when she was burnt. Um, and it seems to have, uh, this text seems to have existed in multiple manuscripts in different languages all across the, all across the Middle Ages. Uh, Marguerite Porret, and this was typical of mystics of this period, lived as an unenclosed, uh, what's called a begin, an unenclosed begin. And these were itinerant, mendicant women who moved from town to town and, from, and went from community to community. Uh, and the church initially tolerated them and increasingly uh, persecuted them because they were trouble. The Beguines often moved together with uh, their brothers, the Begars, from which we get the English word beggar. And Marguerite seems to have had an itinerant uh, 
mendicant life. The key thing here was, you know, this, if you read say, the books like The Name of the Rose or whatever, I mean, did Christ own his cloak, right? This was a huge issue in, in medieval theological discussion. The Franciscans, and then later these, these heretics, believed in the absolute poverty of Christ, right? And the absolute poverty of Christ had to be imitated through a life of absolute poverty and mendicancy. So the, one's life was a refusal of work, uh, an itinerant life, moving from town to town, preaching uh, and trying to convert people. Anyway, Marguerite was treated with relative liberality because she was presumed, we think from the, the upper classes, um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a huge issue here, fascinating issue, it's, which, is, which has caught the attention of um, a number of scholars and uh, a poet like, Amy, uh, like, uh, like Anne Carson, for example, who writes an opera about Marguerite Porret. Um, the way that women are involved in the heresy of the free spirit. Uh, so what we have, if you like, sociologically, is we have the emergence of a leisured female class, the daughters, the unmarried daughters of the bourgeoisie in these Flemish towns, and these women become radicalised theologically and start to move in, in, um, in insurgent political circles. Anyway, Marguerite was uh, prosecuted uh, on two occasions and eventually burnt at the stake in 1310. Um, and her books were burnt with her, it was thought. And she's seen by mystical scholars, scholars of mysticism like Amy Hollywood and poets like Anne Carson as uh, a vital precursor to, to modern feminism. Actually, during her trial, Porette's work is referred to as being not just full of errors and heresies, but she's referred to as a pseudo Molière, a fake woman. Right? It's part of the condemnation of her. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I digress. Well, I don't digress. This, this is the core of, the, of Mr. Clanicism. Um, Marguerite Porret. It's fantastic stuff. In chapter 118 of The Mirror of Simple and Annihilated Souls, she outlines the seven stages which need to be followed in order for the devout soul to become divine. Something we could all follow relatively easily. This evening, later on, after a few drinks, we could... And I won't go into it now, because it would take us too long, and it might be embarrassing. But <laughs> let me just say that there are seven stages. Roughly, you begin by accepting God's law. You overcome, first step, you overcome God's law through the act of love, second stage. Then you... Um, in the third stage, this is, this is where it gets really interesting, you have to, and then we get the use of this extraordinary masochistic language in the, in the female mystics of this period. We have to hack and hew away at ourselves to open up a hole large enough for love to enter, Marguerite says. Hack and hew away at ourselves. Annihilate ourselves so that we open up a space that's large enough for love to enter. Uh, and that the fourth stage is when we feel that love enters. It's all about the refinement of love. And that makes us feel drunk. And I've got a great analysis of the drunkenness of mystical experience using William James and nitrous oxide and whatever. <laughs> William James said the only way he could understand Hegel was on laughing gas, on nitrous oxide. <laughs> but I digress. The fifth stage is when we recover from that drunkenness. We have a hangover and we, we go back to a mood of dereliction, despair, and distance from God. If you know anything about the mystical tradition, you realise this is the common feature of mystics. It's both, the it's both the ecstatic union with the divine and the feeling of dereliction and distance from the divine. That's the fifth step. Um, and that's very painful. The sixth step is the key one. And this is what got her into so much trouble. Um, the task here... And you'll see where this is going in, in a minute, believe me. The task here is the annihilation of the soul. That's what Marguerite Porret sets out to do, to annihilate the soul. And that's a technique that can be learned if you hew and hack away at yourself such that you make yourself nothing. Uh, and she says... Um, the, the, the soul annihilated... She says, sees neither God nor herself, but, 
Listen to this, this is wild. But God sees himself of himself in her, for her, without there. Who, that is God, shows to her that there is nothing except him. And therefore this soul knows nothing except him, loves nothing except him, and praises nothing except him. For there is nothing but he. So the soul annihilated becomes the place for God's infinite self-reflection. Right? Totally amazing. That's the sixth state. Um, if the soul has become nothing, it has the possibility to become divine. That's the heresy. That's the heresy of the free spirit. At that moment, the Lord Spirit is within you. And that's not good. Or if you don't. I've lost 15 pages of my text here. That's, oh, okay. Right, there we are. So, Anne Carson writes in her inquiry, I mean, to, to sort of translate this out a little bit, the seventh stage is, is, is everlasting life, which happens after death. So we'll put that to one side, to one side for the, the moment. Um, Anne Carson rightly asks in her inquiry into how it is that women like Sappho, Simone Weil, and Marguerite Poret, Marguerite Poret tell God. She says, what is it that love dares the self to do? And Anne Carson answers that love dares the self to leave itself behind to enter into poverty. So love, on this account, this is where I'm sort of translating it to a certain extent, certain extent, is the audacity of impoverishment, the audacity of complete submission. It's an act of absolute spiritual daring that induces a passivity where the self becomes annihilated. It's a subjective act where the subject extinguishes itself. Become a husk or an empty vessel through this act of daring, the fullness of love enters in. It's through the act of annihilation that the soul knows nothing but God and loves nothing except him, as Marguerite Porred says. So those are the seven stages of self-deification. Okay. So what? I mean, why was this condemned as heresy? Well, easy, right? Um, once the soul is annihilated, then there's nothing to stop me unifying with God. There's no me anymore. My annihilated soul becomes the space of God's self-reflection. So when I become nothing, I become God. Huh? When I become nothing, I become God. Now, um, what are the consequences of this, this, this belief, this heresy? Um, when I become nothing, I become God. When I become divine in this sense, I achieve a state prior to the fact of original sin. Right? I've annihilated original sin within myself, according to Poret. And if human beings are perfected in this way, then this has dramatic political consequences. The first consequence, and one finds this throughout the, uh, the writings of the Heresy of the Free Spirit and other uh, radical texts of the period, is that private property disappears. The distinction between mine and thine vanishes. In the annihilation of the soul, mine becomes thine, I become thou, and the no place of the soul becomes the space of divine self-reflection. But an experience of divinity is not my individual private property. It is, these writers insist, the commonwealth of those who are free in spirit. So what the heresy achieves is the commonwealth of those who are free in spirit. Private property, then, is just the consequence of our fallen state. Private property is a consequence of original sin. <coughs> so the political form of the movement of the free spirit is communism. Right? And that's why it was so dangerous. And furthermore, it's a communism whose social bond is love, right? and not law. Uh, I've got a whole analysis of the relationship between love and law here that I won't go into. Again, if we had world enough and time, I could show the way in which certain of these tropes reappear, say, in 19th century 
uh, radical traditions. I mean, Marx imagined if, if, uh, a communist society would be a society without law. Right? Um, so. And this is, this is the most dramatic concept. So, no separation between myself and God, no separation between mine and thine, property is held in common, uh, the fact of God is the union of the commonwealth, of the community. The community that's free in spirit is the realisation of, of the divine. That's mystical anarchism right? in, in, a, in, in, its, in its essence. And what was so dangerous about this belief <clears throat> about this heresy, was that if human beings are free of original sin, then there is no longer any legitimacy to moral constraint, any legitimacy to uh, moral prohibition. The only moral prohibitions have to flow directly from the fact of our freedom. And this then leads to the various accusations of immoralism and licentiousness against the heretics of the free spirit. And I don't tend to believe this, but if you look at the literature on this, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll read people who, who will say that, I mean, basically what the heretics of the free spirit, spirit permitted were sort of generalised, sort of fucking or something like that, and, uh, or licentiousness, and people will trace the origins of 18th century libertinage, the fun expression, say, in, in, uh, in the Marquis de Sade, back to the movement of the free spirit. I'm less persuaded by that. I mean, what one finds in this, this mystical anarchism, this heretical uh, movement, is uh, a different idea of the disciplining of the self. It's a disciplining of the self that flows from the fact of freedom, which is something that's only held in common. So, to my mind, uh, the heresy of the free spirit could find expression, I think, more coherently in, in, in communities that were chaste, that practiced chastity. Right? I'm very interested in the theme of chastity for reasons that I can't go into at the moment. <laughs> I mean, for example, think of the Shakers. The Shakers were obviously, obviously heretics, communist heretics, and their social bond was love, which is realised through, through chastity. Anyway, where's this all uh, going to next? Well, what do we make of this heresy? Um, Norman Cohn thinks that um, this heresy is the this this heresy is a constantly recurring and dangerous threat in Western civilization. He's writing in the 50s and 60s, and he's looking at forms of if you like experimental communism in the 1960s and finding their ancestry back in the heresy of the free spirit. And his suggestion is that they should be, they're, they're dangerous. And John Gray obviously endorses that, that view. Another view which you might or might know, might or might, no, you might know about or not, is that of Raoul van Eigen. Raoul van Eigen, who was the, the second most famous situationist behind de Boer, in fact, I got a call at the, got to Toronto Airport and someone from NPR who just says, I'm from NPR. How do you pronounce the, this happened, to, how do you pronounce the, the name D-E-B-O-R-D? <laughs> de Bord. I said, De Boer. Oh, right, De Boer. Okay, good. And how do you pronounce his first name? Guy. Okay, Guy. Well, thank you very much. And just hung up. No idea. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I just got out of immigration at the, uh, the airport. Van Eigen was the second most famous situationist. In 1986, it's late Van Eigen, he writes a book called The Movement of the Free Spirit. And what you see in that book is an attempt to trace situationist ideas of community and freedom back to this medieval heresy. And he thinks it's great, but it's all about, as it were, in a sense for him, libertinage, passionate attraction, and the rest. Um, I won't go into this now, but the, the figure that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, talking about obscure anarchists, uh, Gustav Landauer um, is a fascinating figure, great influence on Benjamin, Scholem, Buber, and all the rest. And I was reading an essay by, by Landauer recently called Anarchic Thoughts on Anarchism where he, um, and the context is very interesting, the context is the assassination of William McKinley, President of the United States in 1901, by someone who professed to be an anarchist because he'd heard a speech by Emma Goldman, 
um, and was sort of enthused by it, so go and kill the president. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Landauer says, what connection does anarchism have to acts of assassination? There's absolutely none at all. And then goes into a, a non-violent a non argument for anarchism. And then, then says towards the end that um, actually uh, anarchism is dependent upon killing oneself. Right? Killing oneself. Uh, he says, it's not enough for us to reject conditions and institutions, we have to reject ourselves. Do not kill others, only yourself. Such will be the maxim of those who accept the challenge to create their own chaos in order to discover their most authentic and precious inner being, and goes on like this. So we find a sort of another way of thinking this idea of self-annihilation uh, as a condition for uh, a transformed um, sociality. Okay, that's, uh, that's that, and that's, that's, we're on page 36. I just want to read my conclusion now which won't take long. This is where it does come, actually, to the issues of the, um, of the, uh, the, the exhibition, the very interesting exhibition. We're living through a long anti-1960s. <laughs> the various experiments in communal living and collective existence that define that period seem to us either quaintly passé, laughably unrealistic, or dangerously misguided. We now know better than to try and bring heaven crashing down to earth and construct concrete utopias. To that extent, despite our occasional and transient enthusiasms, Obamaism or whatever, we're all political realists. Indeed, most of us are passive nihilists and cynics. This is why we still require a belief in something like original sin. Without the conviction that the human condition is essentially flawed and dangerously rapacious, we would have no way of justifying our disappointment. And what human beings want to do more than anything else is to find reasons to justify their misery. Right? That's why people read Agamben. Yeah? <laughs> Pitchy remark. <laughs> if it's indeed true that those utopian political movements of the 1960s, like the Situations International, where an echo of the movement of the free spirit could be heard, led to various forms of disillusionment, disintegration, and in extreme cases, disaster. Experiments in the collective ownership of property or in communal living based on sexual freedom without the repressive institution of the family, or indeed R.D. Lang, I love R.D. Lang's experimental communal asylums with no distinction between the so-called mad and the so-called sane. These all seem like distant, whimsical cultural memories captured in dog-eared yellow paperbacks and grainy, poor quality film. It's a world that we struggle to understand. Perhaps such communal experiments were too pure and overfull of righteous conviction. Perhaps they were, in a word, too moralistic to ever endure. Perhaps such experiments were doomed because, we, what, what, because of what we might call a politics of abstraction, in the sense of being overly attached to an idea at the expense of a frontal denial of reality. What do I mean by abstraction? <clears throat> At their most extreme, say in the activities of the Weather Underground or the Red Army Faction or the Red Brigades of the 1970s, the moral certitude of the closed and pure community becomes fatally linked to a redemptive, cleansing violence. Terror becomes the means to bring about the end of virtue in the guise of proletarian justice, say with the Red Brigades. The death of individuals is just, just a speck on the vast heroic canvas of the class struggle. This culminated in the politics of violence, where acts of abduction, kidnapping and hijacking and assassination were justified through an attachment to a set of ideas. As a character in Jean-Luc Godard's Notre Musique remarks, to kill a human being in order to defend an idea is not to defend an idea, it's to kill a human being. Tuer un homme pour défendre une n'est pas de défendre une idée, c'est tuer un homme. Perhaps such groups were too attached to the idea of immediacy, the propaganda of the violent deed as the impatient attempt to storm the heavens. Perhaps such experiments lacked an understanding of politics as a constant and concrete process of mediation between subjective ethical commitment based on a general principle, for example, the equality of all, and the experience of local organization that builds fronts and alliances between disparate groups and often conflicting sets of interests. So maybe these extraordinary communal experiments of the 1960s suffered from a moralism, a purism, 
a, um, an, a desire for immediacy. <clears throat> Perhaps such utopian experiments in community only live on in the institutionally sanctioned spaces of the contemporary art world. One thinks of projects like L'Association des Temps Libérés from 1995 or Utopia Station from 2003 and many other examples somewhat fossilized in a recent show at the Guggenheim in New York, the Any Space Whatever. In the work of artists like Philip Perenio and Liam Gillick or curators like Hans Ulrich Oberst, there's a, deep, there's a deeply felt situationist nostalgia for ideas of collectivity, action, self-management, collaboration, and indeed the idea of the group as such, uh, the idea of the group. Of, you know, in such art practice, which Nicolas Bourriau has successfully branded as relational, art is the acting out of a situation in order to see if, in Oberst's words, something like a collective intelligence might exist. Right? And the, the, uh, the form of experimentation, for example, that Hans Ulrich uses are these marathons. Right? We put people in a room for 24 hours or in a tent for 24 hours and we'll talk endlessly. And we'll try and, as it were, imagine a collective intelligence, a community. Maybe it would be better if we worked in groups of three, as Gillick notes. Of course, the problem with such experiments is twofold, and it's an obvious critique. On the one hand, they're only enabled and legitimated through the cultural institutions of the art world, and thus utterly enmeshed in the circuits of commodification and spectacle that they seek to subvert, if they seek to subvert it. And on the other hand, the dominant mode for approaching an experience of the communal is usually through the strategy of reenactment. One doesn't engage in a bank heist. One reenacts Patty Hearst's adventures with the Symbionese Liberation Army in a warehouse in Brooklyn or whatever. Or one doesn't, you know, one doesn't uh, engage in student protest and get shot in Kent State. One engages in a beautifully constructed artistic reenactment of that that we have in the exhibition. Um, it's a thought here about the institution and about the concern with reenactment as a mode of thinking about community. Situationist detournement is replayed as obsessively planned reenactment. Fascinating as I find such experiments and the work of the artists involved, one suspects what we might call a mannerist situationism. Right? Mannerist in the sense in which you know, Caravaggio stands to Raphael. We have the same gestures, but more graphically, as it were, described, more dramatically described, and therefore, and also less, less possible to bring into being. The old problem of recuperation that obsessed the situationists does not even apply because such art is completely co-opted by the socioeconomic system that provides its lifeblood. Perhaps, we're witnessing something related to this. I'm trying to think about, now, about forms. So one way of thinking community is to say, well, the art institution becomes, as it were, the place for thinking that. Exhibitions such as the one that Nina has curated. Perhaps we're witnessing something related to this in recent events in France. I'll take one example. <clears throat> I don't know if you know about this example. Surrounding the, the arrest and detention of the so-called Tarnak Nine on the 11th of November 2008. As part of Sarkozy's reactionary politics of fear, itself based on both an overwhelming fear of disorder and a, 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 an explicit desire to finally annihilate the memory of 1968 in France, which means the idea of community. A number of activists who have been formally associated with the group Tikkun were arrested in rural central France by a force of 150 anti-terrorist police helicopters and attendant media. They were living commonly in a small, the small village of Tarnac in the Corrèze district of the Massif Central. Apparently a number of the group's members had bought a small farmhouse and ran a cooperative grocery store and were engaged in such dangerous activities as running a local film club, planting carrots and delivering food to the elderly. With surprising juridical imagination, they were charged by the French state with pre-terrorism, pre-terrorism, right? <laughs> pre-terrorism, right? pre um, an accusation linked to acts of sabotage on France's TGV 
rail system. Now, the basis for this is thought crime, right? This is thought crime. The basis for this thought crime was a passage from a text that they published uh, in 2007 called L'insurrection qui vient, which is an allusion to, amongst other things, Agamben's La Communauté qui vient, coming community. This is the coming insurrection. It'll be coming out in semiotext in a couple of months. <coughs> <clears throat> a wonderfully dystopian diagnosis of contemporary society and a compelling strategy to resist it. The final pages of L'insurrection advocate acts of sabotage against the transport networks of the social machine, as they call it, and ask the question, this is a quotation from the book, how could a TGV line or an electrical network be rendered useless? Right? So that's the justification for the charge of pre-terrorism. Um, two of the alleged pre-terrorists, Julien Coupa and Ildun Levy, are still in jail, as far as I know, and others have been charged with a terrorist undertaking that carries a prison sentence of 20 years. Such is the repressive and reactionary force of the state, just in case anyone had forgotten. As the authors of L'Insurrection remind us, this is a great quote, governing has never been anything than pushing back by a thousand subterfuges the moment when the crowd will hang you. Right? L'Insurrection qui vient has powerful echoes, echoes of the situations, situations international. It's very influenced by Debord and some of the other communist heresies that uh, I've been thinking about. Authorship of L'Insurrection is attributed to La Comité Invisible, the Invisible Committee. And the insurrectional strategy of the group turns around the question of invisibility. I want to think about this a little bit. It's a question of learning how to become imperceptible, they say, of regaining the taste for anonymity and not exposing and losing oneself in the order of visibility, which is always controlled by the police and the state. <coughs> the authors of L'Insurrection argue for the proliferation of zones of opacity, so what does co uh, the community mean in this sense? It means, that it means the, the creation, not of a temporary autonomous zone, but of a zone of opacity, of invisibility. Anonymous spaces where communes might be formed. The book ends with the slogan, again, it's, you know, one almost giggles as you, you, you read it, all power to the commune, tout le pouvoir aux communes. In a nod to Blanchot, these communes are described as désœuvrées, inoperative as refusing the capitalist tyranny of work. Another big situationist theme, right? the, the, the domination of work, the refusal of the category of work, that goes right the way back to the doctrines of the poverty of Christ in the 13th century. Why engage in a life of purposeless work? Um, in another text, which is simply called Call, from a couple of years ago, they, they seek to establish what they call a series of foci of desertion, of secession poles, of rallying points for the runaways, for those who leave, instead of places to take shelter from the control of a civilization that is headed for the abyss. A strategy of sabotage, blockade, and what is called the human strike is proposed in order to weaken still further our doomed civilization. Now, this text in l'insurrection is a compelling, exhilarating, a deeply lyrical text that sets off all sorts of historical echoes with movements like the free spirit and the situationists and the rest. The emphasis on secrecy, upon invisibility, and itinerancy as essential criteria in the thinking community. Secrecy, invisibility, itinerancy. And the cultivation of poverty, radical mendicancy, and the refusal of work. But the double programs, the program here is a program on the one, on one hand of sabotage, we need to sabotage the social machine, as they put it, and secession from it, to leave it, leave it behind. Um, I think this would be my critique of it, that it ends up, it risks again falling into a certain politics of abstraction. Um, I could say more about that. What's, what's interesting about it, I think, is it would be to think about issues of... Um, maybe in relationship to, to art, in, in terms of the cultivation of zones of opacity, invisibility, secrecy, and um, uh, anonymity, right? So, you know, one way of thinking about the increasing immateriality of artistic production here, I mean, the most extreme version may be something like Tino Cigar, right? Where all you get is the 
instructions to how to carry out the, the performance. You don't actually see anything and nothing is documented. But what follows from this? And I'm coming to my conclusion. Are we, to, are we to conclude that the utopian impulse in political thinking is simply the residue of a dangerous political theology that we're much better off without? Is the upshot of the critique of mystical anarchism that we should be resigned in the face of the world's violence and equality and update a belief in original sin with a reassuringly miserabilistic Darwinism? Should we reconcile ourselves with the options of political realism, authoritarianism and liberalism? Should we simply renounce the utopian impulse in our personal and political thinking? If so, then the consequence is clear. It's the consequence is that we stay with the way things are. Right? We stay with the situation. To abandon the utopian impulse in thinking is to imprison ourselves within the world as it is and to give up once and for all the prospect that another world is possible, however small, however fleeting, and however compromised such a world might be. In the political circumstances that presently surround us in the West, to abandon the, the, the utopian impulse in political thinking is to resign oneself to the fact of liberal democracy, which is the rule of the rule, the reign of the law, which renders impotent anything that would break with the law, the miraculous, the moment of the event, the break with the situation in the name of the common. Let me return to a last, for a last time <clears throat> to mystical anarchism and to the question of self-deification. I mean, defending the idea of becoming God is maybe going a little far. <laughs> I, mean, I, I appreciate that. But, uh, and to embrace such a mysticism would be to fall into what someone like Badiou calls the obscurantist discourse of glorification in his book on St. Paul. Uh, I could say more about that. You know, it's to base an idea of politics upon uh, what Badiou calls a ravished subjectivity, the ravished subjectivity of the mystic, communing with the divine. He wants to oppose that to the experience of St. Paul, which he thinks is an ethical experience which is anti-obscurantist. Yet, so we accept, you know, Badiou is right and all of that, yet to acquiesce in such a conclusion would be to miss something vital about mystical anarchism. What I want to call, in closing, it's politics of love. What I find most compelling in someone like Marguerite Porret is the idea of love as an act of absolute spiritual daring. Absolute spiritual daring that eviscerates the old self in order that something new can come into being. In Anne Carson's words, love dares the self to leave itself behind, to enter into poverty and to engage with its own annihilation to hack and hew away at oneself in order to make a space that's large enough for love to enter. What is being attempted by Porret, and perhaps it's only the attempt that matters here, not some theophanic outcome, what's being attempted is an act of absolute daring, not for some nihilistic end, but in order to open what we might call the immortal dimension of the subject the immortal dimension of the subject. First time I've ever written that. The only proof of immortality is the act of love, the daring that attempts to extend beyond oneself by annihilating oneself, a project that projects onto something that exceeds one's powers of projections. What is love? To love is to give what one does not have and to receive that over which one has no power. Right? To give what one does not have and to receive that over which one has no power. As Landau would put it, the point is not to kill others, but to kill oneself in order that a transformed relationship to others becomes possible. Some new way of conceiving community and being with others. Anarchism can only begin with an act of what Landau calls inward colonization. The act of love that demands a transformation of the self. Finally, <clears throat> very simply, such an anarchism is not a question for the future. It's what normally happens at the end of papers like this, it's a question of how one lives now. Uh, the issue in many ways is very simple, it's how does one behave, right? That's, that's the issue. Is such a thing conceivable and practicable without moralism, purism, immediacy, the slide back into delusion, obscurantism and maybe even a cult of violence uh, that we saw with previous communistic experiments? Uh, I don't know. <laughs>
That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>